Hello, I'm Doug, stand-up physicist. Although right now I'm not really standing up because I want to write on this blackboard, which is actually white. Okay, so this is part of a video blog series, Playing in Space-Time, Research Through Outreach. And the title of this talk is Information Theory and Intervals in Space-Time. So what is information theory? Well, it's a way of thinking about conversations in an abstract way, such that you don't really care what people say, you really just care about what they, how they say it. And you can sometimes make incredibly important advances in efficiency by doing so. But it has branched out since that starting point, and actually plays a huge role in physics, particularly quantum mechanics and thinking about black holes. So, can I give an example of information theory? I think so. Oh. So we're going to start out with an equation I'm sure you saw a long time ago. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Okay, so how do we now think about this in a more abstract way? Well, we can do that by creating little boxes around our information. And say, oh good, I have, I can put a 3 in here. If I put a 3 in here, oh, I better put a 5 in here. So, now I can substitute different values and it changes the values, but the form of the equation stays the same. And the form of the equation is reductionist. We have two pieces of information on this side of the equation, and we have one on that. And nature actually prefers, I think, to transform information. That you start with a structure on one side, and you end up with a similar structure on the other. So I'm going to invent a new operator. I'm going to call it almost plus. What almost plus does is it takes this one, and it takes most of this, but not all of it, and ends up over here. Well, you still have that stuff. So what, what, what does that mean when you do that? You go, well, let's say you got a 3.8. You go, oh, well, you still got a 0 0.2. Oh, that's another number. I need a box for it. All right, so let's say this almost operator you do this 20 times and you get a 3.7, a 0.3, and a 3.5, and a 0.5. But let's say you did it one time and you ended up with a 4. 4.0. Cool. Then this would just be 0. But it still has a box where it needs to go. So if you think of this in terms of programming, you have a structure for your two pieces of information over here, and you can use that same structure over here, even when that happens to be zero, because that only happens once in a while. So this is just a toy example, but we'll be kind of returning to this technique of boxes uh, later. So now I want to think about events in space-time. And I think of an event as being just like an explosion. Boom, boom. All right? And that will have a certain time and space location. And using our information theory, we can put boxes around this and say, we've got four pieces of information. Cool. All right. But we say, hold it. That time is relative to what? Well, we must have had an observer who declared, let's see, an observer, right down here. And they were at a particular time, zero, 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 what I call here, now. Okay? That's all well and great. Um, but now that creates a problem. See, if we think about origins, sort of on a piece of graph paper. We could say that point, that is zero, zero. 
that's all good. We come back in five years, zero, zero is still there. With here now, since this here is time, you can't actually get, go, in five years from now, you can't go back to that. <laughs> You're just five years older. So, how do we deal with this origin problem? Uh, we don't just, well, I think what we do is we end up studying not an event, but we think about two events. Boom, boom. Okay, so now we have this, this sort of thing. And then we think about the difference between these two events. So that would be a dt, dx, dy, and dz. Now this still has four boxes. One, two, three, four. But the, this act of subtraction means we've kind of eliminated the role for the origin. Well, it always seems to be the case that when you fix one problem, in, case, in this case the origin, you know, if somebody watches it from here, they're still going to get the same value of dt, dx, dx, dy, dz, you create a new problem. And the new problem has to do with something known as Riemann geometry. And in Riemann geometry, events are not that interesting. They're just kind of places to attach your tangent space. You create your tangent spaces. And if you want to do this subtraction, you take uh, your vector there and you transport it over to here. And then you could subtract it from the, the, this one and, uh, and, and go forward. Now, to be honest, most people don't do that because you need not only a metric tensor, but you need a connection which tells you how your metric tensor changes go, uh, as you go along this path. And people say, you know, space-time's awfully darn flat, really. So let's just, like, simplify it and just go subtract it. But it's, it's something to worry about. Okay, so what do we do with uh, this difference of, of events? Well, not too much. What is actually more interesting is thinking about what could two different observers agree upon. All right, and that came out of Einstein's work in special relativity. And what they can agree about is the interval. So let us write the interval. dt squared minus dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. This is at the heart of special relativity, um, and that minus sign has all kinds of fun logical consequences, but how do they calculate this interval? Uh, they use a Greek letter, d tau squared, for it. All right, well, they use something called a metric tensor. So I'm going to write out a metric tensor over here. G, T, T, G, T X G T Y G T Z G X T G X X G X Y G X Z G Y T G Y X G Y Y G Y Z Great G Z T G Z, X, G, Z, Y, G, Z, Z. There's our metric tensor. And then we use that to contract two, um, two four vectors. So let me write my four vector, D, T, D, X, D, Y, D, Z, D, T, D, X, D, Y, D, Z. Great. And now we use our box analysis. So we start drawing boxes uh, down the diagonal. We've got four. Then off diagonal, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. And then we got these. Oh, I didn't tell you everything. This value is exactly the same as that. This is a symmetric tensor. All right. And 
Therefore, once I have that, I don't need any more information to fill in that one. So there are 10 here. There are 4 here. And the result of that sort of thing is one value. So we have this great reductionist kind of situation here of 14 down to 1. But actually, in curved space, it's even greater reduction. Because in curved space, these guys are not all constants. Uh, well, how do you figure out what those values are? Well, you have to deal with the Einstein field equations. Minus uh, G nu, some constant, all right? And this is actually 20 second order nonlinear differential equations. All right, so now what we've got is you need 34 equations, 34 bits of information, in order to figure out one. And since I am of the opinion that nature doesn't really like that much reductionism, <laughs> she prefers to transform information. You were like this, and now I look at it slightly differently, and I get that, and I can figure out some things about how nature works because of that. So what do I do instead? I use, um, I use space times numbers, uh, space time numbers. Now that's my own invention. It's, it's really a, a variation on quaternions. What a quaternion is, is it's a number that has four parts that can be added, subtracted, multiplied, and divided. So this looks like it's a square or something. So we're going to just basically square a quaternion and see that we end up with uh, things where we've got some overlap. But a quaternion times a quaternion is a quaternion. And it starts with four pieces of information. It ends with four pieces of information. I can't actually end up at the interval. I have to end up at the interval and some other stuff. All right, so let's just see how I do that. So I've got a dq squared. So I'm going to be starting with a, a typical. Square it up. And that equals dt squared minus dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. And then 2dt d x, 2 d t d y, 2 d t d z. All right? So this part here is the interval. All right? And this part here I call space times time. All right? Great. So now we take our pick. And we say we started with 1, 2, 3, 4, 4. And we ended up with 1, 2, 3, 4. And I say, that's great. We've started, we ended up with exactly what we started with, and nature likes kind of conserving information in that way. And my, my data structure for where I start is exactly the same as my data structure where I ended up with, and that makes it really great. But how do I say these statements about special relativity or I'm in curved space-time? How do I deal with those? I mean, that's what I'm supposed to be dealing with. Well, what I realized was I used to always say things like, wow, well, that's an inertial observer like it's an absolute statement. And I don't think you can do that. I think you can say, hey, these two are, are, inertial, are an inertial observer pair. Okay? And maybe there's a different kind of statement that you can make when somebody's in a gravity field. So now I'm going to talk about three observers. I'm going to talk about observer, the blue observer. And they're going to have their own dq squared values, 
which ends up with a d tau squared. And as shorthand, I'm just going to do do um, dt dr as a shorthand for their space time sign. Okay, and now we're going to have an observer in red, and they're going to have a d squared having their d tau squared. 2 dt dr. And I'm going to have a third observer in green. Why not? All right. Great. So, um, let's say that this observer was traveling at a constant velocity relative to that observer. Then from work we've done in special relativity and confirmed so many times, we know that their d taus, their intervals, are going to be exactly the same. But the space times time values are going to be different. In fact, you can use the difference in these two to figure out exactly how one is in motion relative to the other. So we, if we say, um, d tau squared, the interval, equals the interval in red. And further, that, that these are different, their space times time values are different, that These are uh, inertial observer. This is this this is an an inertial observer pair. Alright? Great. But if we go and we say for the green, blue green, their intervals are not the same. But that their space times time values are in fact equal. Then we would. Then I am going to claim that this is um, this is an equivalence equivalent class uh, pair and due to gravity. That's a, you might say, oh my goodness, that's such a huge leap. Well, it turns out to be a much smaller leap than you might uh, uh, initially think, because this is almost true w in general relativity. In general relativity, um, if you're if observe if if these two are not in motion to relative to each other, but say green is is farther away from a gravitational source, this will almost be true. And I'm coming up with a new proposal, and it says, no, that's not approximately true, that's exactly true. And so that's how I'm dealing with gravity, is I'm saying, this is an equivalence class pair. Now, the final thing is, of course, the blue versus the green. And blue versus green, no, 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 sorry, red versus green. And now the final set is red versus green, and red guys not equal, and this guy not equal, uh, the green guys, right? Um, so what do you do in that situation? Well, the, I think the algebra just gets harder to deal with, but uh, that's okay because you will be you will have pairs of observers that are 
different distances from a gravitational source and are moving relative to each other. It happens. Uh, it just <laughs> means you don't want to study it because it's, the math gets too hard. So w the, the main thing I want to say in terms of information theory is this message of general relativity has this reduction of 34 down to 1 which is quite the boiling down of, of things. Uh, but I think that nature really prefers to say, no, I've got four pieces of information, you end up with four pieces of information. And if you have different observers, you can use this information to tell the different relationships between pairs of observers. All right. So, thank you very much.